right, the right, the right, the right. So, 10 seconds for voting. Last 10 seconds for voting and then please take your seats. All right, so everyone, please take your seats. We have ended the voting session. Guys in the back. All right, we have a special way to get everyone here, so just let's clap. All right, it worked. So, we're done with the voting session. Hello, guys. Hello, guys. I think they're the teams are already started to be formed right there. Uh, All right, so we finished the voting part of the evening. What's going to happen now is I have special uh, late comer one minute pitch that I'm going to introduce to you and during that time we're also going to start voting uh, we're also going to start counting the votes so let's hear the the late comer for the one minute pitch hi I'm Carsten um, the problem is that uh, getting stuff to the moon is very expensive and uh, the solution I would propose is uh, very simple. I want to make it more affordable by using commercial off-the-shelf technology and uh, I want to do it in an industrial way. And uh, yeah, I want to use the latest technology in uh, artificial intelligence and all the cool stuff. And um, I'm going to make Mexico pay for it. And, <laughs> and uh, the people we need, we need to have... Um, you know, software developers, hardware developers, we need uh, accountants, we need space lawyers, we need uh, ma marketing people, we need physicists, we need uh, orbital mechanics guys, um, we need... <laughs> this we definitely don't need um, We need to have rocket science, uh, scientists and uh, all of that. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's my pitch. Um, who's going to buy in my company? <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know it was that easy. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. Um, I'm here for a bit more um, motivational. I want to motivate you uh, in uh, starting a space company. Um, I'm not sure why I was invited because actually that's a lot of work. I'm, I'm not sure if you know what you're getting into. Um, so I will tell you a bit about what we have done and then you can decide on your own uh, whether you want to do the same or not. Um, I recommend you not. It's a lot of work. So. Um, yeah, I'm from a company called PT Scientists. Um, we have a very simple goal. Uh, we want to go back to the moon. And in particular, we want to go back to Apollo 17. And we want to take the picture of the moon rover that has been sitting on the surface of the moon for about 45 years uh, this year, exactly. And we want to take a picture because, you know, made from quite interesting materials. So, who are we? Um, we're a group of people, uh, we are now 18 employees um, and we are about 35 people working on this mission and we started by the end of 2008, so if you do your calculations that's quite a while ago. Um, this was Our team was founded by Robert Böhme and um, yeah, we have some people here, a really cool guy, this guy, Jack Crenshaw, 
Um, he was also doing the trajectory calculations for Apollo. Um, so I think he's our oldest member that we have in the team. Um, he was telling me the story that when he went down, uh, when he did some calculations, um, he went to the computer room and it was a room full of women in with the logarithmic books and looking up things so that they can solve the equations that he provided them. So he's really old and uh, still supporting <laughs> us. Uh, okay, that didn't come out right. Um, anyhow, so yeah, we're very um, proud of, of having him on our team. So he will help us to actually get there. And since the end of 2008, we developed quite a lot of technology. Um, we developed a spacecraft which is capable of carrying 100 kilograms to the surface of the moon. And uh, we developed what is now has become the Audi Luna Quattro, which is a uh, rover for the surface of the moon, um, probably the best looking one. Um, also, it has a top speed of 3.6 kilometers per hour, which is probably the slowest Audi, um, <laughs> at least on Earth. Uh, on the moon, it will be the fastest. Um, yeah. And we have developed with, uh, with quite a few people uh, of getting where we are. And um, our first mission that we are going to do is, um, our marketing com company came up with a name. It's ingenious. It's called Mission to the Moon. Um, it, says what it, it does what it says on the, on the bottom. And so, but we want to return to the moon, uh, lunar rover vehicle that the Apollo astronauts were driving because it's made from all the kind of material that you don't want to use in nowadays space, right? So it's uh, or maybe not all of them, but uh, there was quite a few materials like uh, the fender problem, so it was fixed with duct tape, and uh, we want to see, you know, is duct tape a solution of building a moon village? Um, <laughs> or what happened to the other materials? It's quite interesting. We know very little about the moon uh, in general. Uh, we think we know a lot, but uh, in fact, we only have been there a few times, especially to the surface of the moon. Uh, we have been in orbit around the moon where we can take pictures of, in particular, the um, the LRV, the Lunar Rover Vehicle, but it's just five pixels. And from those five pixels, you can tell if it's sitting there, like in the picture that, I sh that I'm showing you, or whether it has been bombarded to shreds by micrometeorites, right? It could have been, you know, uh, you know, or it could not be there at all, but, you know, those are different kind of folks. Um, <laughs> and uh, we are not going to convince them with facts, so that's certainly we can do. Uh, so it would be interesting to see if that, you know, the the moon doesn't have any atmosphere, so it's very, it, it does it's the dust should not be on there, um, but it could be on there. So if whether whether or not there is dust on it, it will be interesting to go back and figure it out and see what happened to all the other materials like uh, nylon, etc. So if you if you think about the future of space exploration and you build a uh, a village on the moon, like the moon village, then you want to know what materials are good and uh, which, which ones are not. Um, our mission is very simple. Um, we take a rocket that gets us to Earth orbit. From Earth orbit, we fly with our spacecraft. And then we land, where is it? Uh, not there. Um, we changed it already. Um, we are going to land here. Then we are driving up, the, so this is about five kilometers. Um, take some pictures of the lunar rover vehicle. And uh, if we still have some spare time, we're going to back to orange soil, which is a very interesting geological point on the moon. Um, sounds easy, right? <laughs> it's not too complicated. There's some rocket science involved, but that's okay. Um, yeah, the, the downside is we only have um, ten, and a, uh, 10 and a half days um, to get there because on when you're standing on the surface of the moon uh, and you have sun, the temperature of the soil can reach up to 120 degrees Celsius. And in the night, the temperature can fall to minus 180 degrees Celsius. And uh, one day, uh, one moon, uh, moon day is essentially one half, half a month on Earth, and then you have half a month of darkness. So surviving the lunar night is, uh, is quite a challenge. And we're not going to do that in the first mission. So our first mission is really just a lunar day, and then it's over. So, um, but I'm here in, you know, talking about people that want to, want to start a company. So what's in for us? So the, the reason why, uh, why we are working on it as a company is essentially uh, we want to bring surface to the moon and we want to sell it as a payload. So for just 1 million euros per kilogram, you can buy um, payload and uh, we will deliver it to the surface of the moon. 
it's like Uber, but for the moon. Like, um, uh, well, Uber will be with people, but so this is uh, a few decades uh, in the coming. Um, and also, we are bringing uh, communication to the surface of the moon. So we are in our first mission, we are going to bring an LTE base station. So that's the one that your mobile phone is connecting to. And uh, with that, we want to demonstrate that um, commercial technology that is used on the moon, uh, or sorry, on Earth, can be used on the moon as well. And uh, the plan is that once the moon village is done, we are going to become rich on the roaming fees because they will be astronomical, right? Um, yeah, uh, so our spacecraft, as said, um, has about 100 kilogram. Um, the first mission uh, is slated to be to launch by the end of 2018, so that's, uh, in terms of space exploration, that's tomorrow. And, uh, but we have been working on this since the end of 2008, so that's not just PowerPoint engineering. Um, and we, we are going to land, oh by the way, we are going to land two rovers uh, near Apollo 17. Um, because it looks much nicer if you have two, then you can, one can drive and the other one can film it. And um, also for redundancy reasons. Yeah. Uh, we are also taking some signs um, with us to the moon. But the, the future is that um, we are going to launch our second mission, which will launch to the South Pole, which has a much, uh, or North Pole, depending on what the scientists say. But we want to, uh, this is much harder to land and it will be uh, longer. And then uh, we're going to the capacity of our spacecraft and um, bring up fancier stuff. And then hopefully someone, uh, ESA, will be ready with the plans for the Moon Village. And uh, we will make it so, or maybe we start with the Moon Village and then the ESA will join us. Um, but the cool thing is that we do everything in-house. So we have um, operations, so we, have a, we are building a mission control center in our facility. We have um, we have just a, a new facility uh, with 2,200 square meters um, in Berlin. Um, so that's uh, half of it is a production facility where we have a lunar test bed um, where we can drive to, to vehicle tests. Um, the other one will be the mission control and uh, testing integration will be also there. And uh, well, who doesn't know the moon village? What? Okay, you've been living behind the moon then I guess. Anyhow, so um, the, the Moon Village is, uh, is a vision presented by Jan Werner. It's not a program yet, you know, um, but it's a, it's a vision that he's presenting. It's a place on the Moon where um, humanity can meet. It's unlike the ISS, where, um, where countries are not allowed to connect to because of political issues, but it's a place on the Moon. Everyone can go there. Every country can go there. And uh, so this is what uh, what we are working on. We want to uh, we want to make it happen. And um, those are some of the parts we are working with. And um, those rings um, is obviously Audi. Um, there is Vodafone. We have some NASA payload. Um, we are we are working with a DLR, and uh, we are kind of supported by ESA. Um, yeah. Uh, Is a <laughs> they they don't disagree with us no <laughs> so, um, so yeah any questions to that yeah one so there are, there is a competition called the Google and X Prize which I didn't tell you about we all got started. Um, but we left that one. Um, we don't care about it. Uh, we didn't care about it too much uh, in general, but uh, we especially don't care about it right now. Um, coming to where we started, <laughs> so uh, you know, I want I wanted to give you an insight of um, of how we started this. Um, you know, this was the glossy presentation that you saw was you know for business investor things, people serious people in uh, with suits that we talked to. Um, but I want to give you an insight of, of um, how to start such an endeavor, and um, our, uh, some of this is the first picture of uh, of the team that we found. Um, they actually pr had uh, already a logo which looked very bad, but um, they didn't know better. And um, they they met at uh, Nux Tage in Chemnitz. So this was uh, initiated by Robert Böhme, who was much younger that time, um, and. Well, yeah, so uh, they met and 
um, just in by the beginning of uh, this one, mid 2010. So the, uh, the picture before was, I think, mid 2009. This was mid 2010. Um, I joined, which was probably the most important turn in the history of uh, PTS. Um, and then we got a very because um, we felt like we were grown-ups because we got a booth at the ILA, which is, uh, you know, the International Aeronautics. Um, so essentially, this was by the end of 2010, it was, and we presented a new rover, which was very fancy. It was, um, it was all 3D printed materials, and it was super expensive. It was, I think, 30,000 euros, and we were, if you think about it today, we were like, 30,000, what? Yeah, that's really cheap. It's like... <laughs> You know, it's uh, so, but we were very, very, you know, careful with that one. It was super expensive and it could actually drive, so it was really cool. It had motors in there and uh, it didn't drive very well. And uh, our engineer forgot that um, we don't have one six gravity here on Earth, so the suspension didn't work. Um, oh, he ordered the wrong springs to be more precise. Um, well, it has some deficits, but the good thing, you know, the booze uh, was very expensive. Um, uh, and but the, it was a turning point for us because we have been working on the mission for about what is it two years or that one and let's say one and an I was working for on it for ha one and a half years and um, we got uh, the DLR accepted so um, DLR um, Oberpfaffenhofen the RMC they got um, they came to our booth and said well this is really cool and we were like oh yeah yeah. And uh, so at we, we went uh, we went to them, uh, we visited them, them and we got a workshop where we designed actually our third generation rover, uh, which we then had for quite a while. And this was really cool because we announced publicly announced that we are working with the DLR. Um, and the <laughs> funny thing is, uh, none of us has a background in any space stuff, right? So, um, we, oh, did I, did I say, oh, we, I, I forgot to mention, we started out as part-time scientists, by the way. So we did this in our spare time. So we had our real day jobs. Um, my was not a real day job because I was um, actually a PhD candidate at university. But anyone else had a real time day job. And uh, so in the evenings, you know, usually, uh, for example, on, on Wednesday evening from 9 till usually uh, 11, uh, in the evening there was uh, our electronics meeting where we discussed what needs to be done from the electronics. And uh, on the next week we discussed what had been done and what needs to be done. And so this is what we did, right? Um, and the name part-time scientist lived up to its name. Um, so that was pretty cool. We were like super excited to see what the how the DLR is working. Then we came to them and we realized, say, the office just looks uh, as crappy as uh, as my desk art does, and and they are not the super brain geniuses that I expected to work there. You know, those are. Sorry if anyone is offended from the DLR. Um, don't take it personally. So, but th I realized that. Um, those are just regular engineers, and they they are not uh, superhuman in their capabilities. And it's well, sometimes it's rocket science what they're working on, but most of the time it's just very good engineering uh, in a in a very specialized field. Um, those are um, we we partnered with uh, Technical University of Vienna, um, who were building uh, the first prototype, a real life prototype of uh, of our landing vehicle. We in the uh, and this we beside the rover, we also worked uh, on the lander, which is a little, little known fact. But another really um, interesting turning point in our history was that, um, aside from me joining, <laughs> um, was that uh, we convinced. So there was a, in the, the good price was running, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't going anywhere. But and so they came up with the idea that um, they made an interim competition where the teams had to show. That their hardware is capable of, you know, working on the lunar surface, and in order for the for that, they had a judging panel, which are those guys. Um, those are all uh, space industry experts that uh, have been work have flying missions, so they know what they are talking about, and um, they looked at our test campaign, validated that we did it all properly, and uh, occasionally gave us some hints, which they weren't allowed to. And uh, with that, we won 750,000 US dollars. Uh, within the Google Lunar X Prize, and we always had uh, the the strange idea. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so with that, we created our office. Uh, there was some guy Frank um, who 
who donated um, some money for pizza for us uh, on PayPal. And we, so we made this picture for him. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Frank, if you see this, thank you. Um, this was our first audit. We were super excited. It was 160 square meters. And um, we, they can accommodate some people. And uh, yeah, so that was super exciting. We also employed people. So this is where we changed our name from, from part-time scientist to PT scientist. And um, <laughs> that's, it's not, well, you know, we're not very creative, but you know, we get things done. Um, anyhow, so yeah, so we had our office in full time um, or a bit more than full time. And uh, we always had the idea that it should be possible to, to go to one of those companies that host those outrageous multi million marketing. Um, funds and uh, tell them, hey, give us some money, you know, we will do a mission for you and you know, we'll get some advertising in return, right? And uh, so in initially, you know, we, we thought like, uh, how much should we ask for? Um, we are like, okay, 120 million sounds good. We should definitely be. Um, no, it doesn't work this way. Um, this is what we learned. Um, but in the end, um, we got the four rings. Um, this was not easy, I can tell you that. You know, if you think about your business involving getting sponsored by, by a big brand, it's not easy. Um, this was by the beginning of 2016, we officially announced that we were working with them. So that was uh, you know, seven and a half year or seven years, let's say, of hard work of getting this done and negotiating the deal took one year. So yeah, this is a this is a big company, a big ship, and um, and it wasn't they give, didn't give us 120 million. I can tell you that, um, but they give us sufficient money so that we can uh, we can continue our development. And but in particular, they also helped us to design the Audi Luna Quattro, um, which has you know a very cool name um, and. They helped us to reduce the weight. Um, there are some 3D printed wheels over there, so if you have time, you know, take it in your hand, feel it, and it's uh, extraordinarily lightweight. It's one millimeter thin aluminum 3D printed stuff, and they helped us to reduce the weight from 45 kilograms to 35 kilograms. So that's pretty significant, considering um, as a company, this allows us to sell 20 more of payload, which is worth 20 million, right? Um, unfortunately, um, Governmental um, agencies are a bit concerned about flying payload uh, on the startup because uh, you know this is a hipster thing to do, and they are not very hipster. Um, but uh, yeah, in the end, um, we also um, we also got Vodafone on board. Um, this took another half a year of negotiation. You know, it, you you expect that once you have one big deal in, you know things will get much easier. They don't. Unfortunately, it's still a lot of work. Those companies are big. They need to uh, they need to have a good reason to invest in you, and um, you need to convince them. It's a lot of talking, lots of PowerPoint, and uh, all the stuff that I hate. Um, um, I, I, of course, I love you, right? Uh, I like, <laughs> yeah. But you get some really nice uh, things to do, right? So this was um, the Alien Covenant premiere, and uh, actually, if you watch the movie, um, at about. Uh, half an hour or so, there's, um, there are three scenes where you can see a rover um, helping um, the crew of the, uh, the Covenant to, to die more slowly. Um, no spoiler there. Um, so, yeah, so th we, this is the cool stuff that you get if you're working uh, with a big brand. And um, also, um, they do very cool marketing stuff. And I want to show you a little bit of that and then I'm done. Place. The final frontier. For generations we have shared in the excitement of exploring strange new worlds and going where no man has gone before. And yet many people wonder why we should go there again. My name is Frank Schätzing. I write books about the future. And I would like to show you why our future lies in the stars. Therefore, we have to look at our past.
Four billion years ago, DNA evolved in the primeval oceans. Life forms developed, failed, succeeded. Until one chattering ape rose up and started doing what none of the others could, imagining the future. The first pioneer was born. Because with the power to imagine the future came the power to shape it. Pioneers are driven by special genetics. A novelty-seeking gene is built into their DNA that makes them take risks, overcome boundaries, and push humanity forward. Pioneers have unlocked the mysteries of nature, studied the stars, turned our view of the world upside down, and created a mountain of problems for themselves. Because what distinguishes visionaries from the majority is that they see things that others don't see or understand. Today, Galileo's heliocentric model of the solar system and Darwin's theory of evolution are textbook stuff. But they were bitterly contested at the time. Even today, the public opinion often is, visions are fine, as long as they bring instant benefits. But the course of human history has been set precisely by such far-sighted visions. And today, we are about to realize the next one. In 1969, one giant leap for mankind generated global euphoria. But once the space race was won, the mission was accomplished, over and out. Now we need new pioneers that show us the path into the future. Visionaries such as Richard Branson, Google and Audi are driving space travel forward, and they are being criticized too. Don't we have enough problems on Earth that we should solve first? Yes, we do. And that's exactly why space travel is of such an importance. So Audi and the part-time scientists are going on the mission to the moon in humanity's best interest. But why is the moon our next logical step? Let's have a look at it. Ice deposits at both poles can be used to make fuel. Filling stations in space would dramatically reduce the cost of long-range missions to resource-rich planets, for instance. Helium-3 could provide us with clean energy for thousands of years, and on the moon alone there are millions of tons of this stuff. Moon telescopes could expand our knowledge of the universe tremendously, help identify habitable planets and provide an early warning system to avert the greatest of all threats, meteorites, which can be warded off better from the moon. Reasons enough for a team of German engineers to risk a return to our neighboring satellite. In 2009, the part-time scientists came together, inspired by the vision of putting a research vehicle on the moon. The data and images it is to transmit back will provide us with new insights and lay the groundwork for future missions. Audi and the part-time scientists have designed a special rover to do just that. The Audi Lunar Quattro. An Audi of truly universal capabilities. A masterpiece of engineering. Equipped with Quattro, e-tron, ultra-lightweight and connectivity technology, the Audi Luna Quattro is ready for the moon's challenges. Perhaps the car of the future. Not the first time that space technology would enrich in our daily life. Going to the moon makes sense, and it even makes us smarter. Whenever Homo sapiens challenges his intellect, his brain takes a leap forward. Venturing out into new terrain triggers our evolutionary development. The Earth is our home, and so is the cosmos it lies in. Our ancestors were driven by the desire for knowledge, and today we know we live on a fragile and vulnerable island floating in space. The answers lie out there.
Okay, so um, yeah, that's pretty cool, I think. Um, forget the helium three part, but that's uh, you know a science fiction author, so he's free to do that. Um, one thing I want to I want to give you um, you know as a as a learning from all of what we have done, and that is the most important part of what why we are there where we are now, is because we as a team are working very very well together. We have a, we, you know, our team is our biggest strength that we have, and uh, we we worked on this, no matter what the circumstance was. In the beginning, we had um, no money. Well, now we have no money, but we, <laughs> it's uh, fluctuating a lot. Um, and uh, but the thing is that we we put in our own time, our own money occasionally, and we continued um, to to get to our aim where we wanted to, to get put something on the moon. And this is what got us to where we are. Gradual progress um, got us to attach new, uh, more and more exciting partners. In the beginning it was DLR, um, then it was Audi, then it was Vodafone, and there will be a new partner announced uh, at the beginning of next year, which will be super exciting. Um, yeah, so this is uh, what I want to give you uh, as a learning. Um, space is hard. <laughs> Do something else. Have fun. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Uh, okay. So the, the, vis the, the vision of our company is to offer transportation service to the surface of the moon. That's really it. Um, you know, if you think about uh, the space station, for example, it's slated to be um, to be decommissioned by 26 uh, or 24, um, depending on who you ask. Um, and there should be a successor project to it. And we really hope um, that this is going to be the moon village. Because it's uh, having a, a lunar outpost where humanity can, can live on the surface of the moon is a logical step towards mass colonization. And so in order, you know, the people that got rich um, in, the, um, in the gold rush uh, were not the people um, digging for gold. It was the people laying the tracks the, uh, for the trains and uh, buying, uh, selling shuffles. And so we want to we want to sell um, the, the service of getting to the surface of the moon for, for all those that are currently unavailable to afford it. There are universities that want to bring payloads that have developed instruments that, uh, that should go on the surface of the moon, but um, they live in countries where um, they don't have a space agency that they can talk to, where they have no influence to, to any trans means of transport um, to the surface of the moon or to space at all. And so we, are, we as a private companies are, are catching those um, that currently can't get um, to the surface of the moon. And there is a quite, uh, quite a significant interest in, uh, in lunar transport services. But as I said, we also um, want, we, we, we don't just want to be um, the Uber of space transportation, but we want to um, build communication infrastructure on the surface of the moon, which becomes more, increasingly more of interest uh, when you are thinking about building the lunar village. So you need to have more rovers. And the reason why a rover is so big is because it has to have the communication infrastructure to talk to Earth directly. Um, whereas uh, future um, explorations could have the LTE coverage so that they can operate within and um, you know, lower the cost of space exploration, make it more accessible to everyone. And yeah, this is essentially the vision. So, um, in our first mission, the, the rovers take up about 70 kilograms. So, we have 30 kilograms of payload capacity that we can sell. Um, and we have, a, I would say, 5 kilograms left, uh, around about there. Yeah. The end of 2018. Yeah. Much more reasonable, right?
Yeah, so we have um, we booked. Uh, we did not buy a rocket by itself, but we um, we bought uh, a contract with Space Flight Services, um, who are brokering us with a shared ride on the SpaceX Falcon 9. <laughs> um, uh, neither. So the thing is, um, space is interesting because um, the space treaty says that uh, the moon doesn't belong to anyone, um, and so uh, there is a there, there is a little protection um, for if you put something on the surface of the moon, and that is, if you are on an ongoing experiment, you are not allowed to disturb it. So, and. From a strict legal point of view, um, you know this is like international waters, and um, if you're if you're going to run over the um, the American flag, um, you know we will have a bad time with Americans, um, but uh, there is no law that prohibits us from doing that. Having said that, this is not what we're going to do, <laughs> just to be sure. So um, we sat down with uh, with NASA to develop um, guidelines on how to approach um, heritage sites uh, such as Apollo. And um, what, they, what they came up with is um, this um, two-kilometer parameter around the landing site, which should protect it from dust that is, uh, that is flying towards it. So we are not allowed to land um, in this area. Um, this is why we are landing here, which is you know, quite, a bit of, uh, quite a bit away. And then you have um, a 225-meter um, parameter around um, the landing site, which is, where, which is called the buffer zone where um, we are temporarily allowed to drive into, but not permanently. So we, are, um, we can drive into, but uh, we need to drive out uh, until the end of the lunar night. And uh, so this was what they came up with, and uh, obviously we are following that uh, exactly. So we, are, we are want to make very sure that we are not disturbing anything. There is um, there's a, there's a chance of disturbing anything, but there is also an opportunity of learning something. And uh, the same guidelines that us from going there also has a list of things to do when we are there. So there's a, yeah, it always is a two faith thing, but we want to be very careful and uh, we're working with all the experts that, um, that we find that uh, are, you know, to make sure that we're not doing anything stupid. So we did an extensive testing of the rover in all kind of terrain and never tipped over. Um, and you know I'm a very bad driver, so it's, it's I mean, the chances of it tipping over are slim to none. Um, I promise you. Um, the uh, the wheel size was um, essentially from our learnings over the years. So we started out with with wheels about this size. And uh, we got increasingly bigger, and the latest one was like Audi saying, "Hey, you know, bigger wheels look better." Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we uh, no, because they said it's uh, more for the terrain and etc. Um, and so this is what we came up with now, and uh, we are very happy about it. We did lots of testing in very different terrain. We have uh, in our basement we have uh, well, yes, uh, we have um, a test facility, so it's uh, six by ten meter. Um, uh, Lunar regular simulant, and uh, we do all of our testing there um, to make sure that we are not missing anything. I saw in the picture of the lander, you have two uh, peepods there. Two what? Peepods, uh, pretty cute there. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. yep. Uh, are you planning to release the green orbit? Or <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that is, uh, that is something that we are offering. So uh, if you want to be placed into a lunar orbit, um, we can do that for you. Um, the price is about the same uh, as live to service, essentially. Yeah. And uh, those are the cubes that dispensers that uh, he was asking about. More questions? Well, let's start with the moon first, okay? <laughs> 
you know, there's you know, there are plenty of other moons um, which are interested, you know, um, but well, baby steps first, right? <laughs> um, we did not specifically optimize it for it, um, but you know, the I think the curvature on this one is more is maybe to some optics things, but yeah, the the rover definitely is. Um, this is uh, you know the Audi design department uh, was getting very fancy on the design. We said no 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 no, it needs to have a camera head over there. Well, this looks awful. You're like, but it needs a camera head. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. So the the rover is really optimized for design, and uh, the spacecraft just happens to be nat a natural beauty. <laughs> uh, this is a actually a physical model. So it's a, this is a structural model. It's made from the correct materials, but um, the thrusters are not, uh, and the tanks are, for example, not the correct ones. Um, those are the ones that we use for for drop testing, for example. So we we lift it up, drop it, and you don't want to do that with the real thrusters because they are really expensive. Um, so the uh, actually building building the stuff is not the hard part. You may think like, oh, this takes a lot of time, but um, we built the rover in six weeks. Um, it's this is not the hard part. The hard part is um, designing everything, testing everything, doing the simulation. You need to develop the software for the spacecraft, you need to simulate it for the spacecraft, you need to build a mission control center, and uh, there's lots of engineering involved before you actually go to build hardware, which is just 5% of the mission, actually, I would say. No, 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 they are super. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that, well, no, no, they really not, it's, um, yeah, it was it was really quite a lot of fun um, of working with Audi, uh, and still is. We are still working with them, and uh, Vodafone is, is quite the same. Yeah. With what? Yes, they uh, they no. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell me, let me tell you about banks. Um, <laughs> the problem with is that if you're going to tell them. Um, that you're going, that you're working on the first private mission to the moon, they will tell you for some reason that you're a atypical company um, because y you need to have uh, you need to have a steady income so that they can want to give you a loan or anything. So um, right now we can get zero loan because we are a atypical company. We have, you know, our cash flow looks like this, like millions in, millions out, millions in, millions out, and um, in the beginning it was less, but you know the spikes got bigger. And um, yeah, so banks are a pain in the ass. Um, venture capitalists um, are always very interested, um, but uh, you know they want to see the return of investment, and uh, that's not trivial to show. Um, although we do have some tricks, um, but uh, you know, this is the competitive space, and uh, I can't talk about it too much. But you know, it's interesting. Any more? Yeah. Maybe just return the one million for a kilogram of payout. Does it make a number or do you have a good sense of the Um it, it sounded nice and also ESA is willing to pay it. Um on our website it says actually eight hundred thousand euros per kilogram. But uh, once we found out that they're willing to pay one million, we said uh, this is just for the first mission. And um it's uh one million um gives us a very nice number. Um, because uh, so, if we if we think about it um, in a long-term vision, so without the development costs um, of our of our deal, but if you want to do it in like seriously for several times, um, one mission costs us about um, 50 million euros, and um, with one spa uh, spacecraft fully uh, fully booked, we can um, generate revenue of of about 100 million, and I think from a profit point of view, this sounds quite nice. Yeah, but in the beginning we were engineers. We were like, "Nah, they will never pay money for it." So this was another learning. So um, it took us, you know, um, until when was it? Uh, I think, two, uh, yeah, five years or six years until we started to realize 
there are really people that are interested in buying payload with us. And we didn't understand why, but we were certainly willing to offer it. Um, yeah, so, and this is now our main business, essentially. So we pitched, essentially, from, from initially, and, yeah. More questions? No? Well, if you are here tomorrow, as well, if you want to ask me any questions, feel free to come up. Um, we also have, hell yeah, it's rocket science stickers, even though no rocket scientist is working for us, um, and other gadgets. Thanks. Thank you so much. Was that inspirational? Are you ready to start working on your own uh, projects and companies? Are you ready to start working on your own projects? Good, I know, it's been a long day. All right, so we have the nine teams that got the biggest number of votes from you guys. You want to hear who they are? So, I'm going to announce the name of the project, and I'm going to ask the persons that presented to come here on stage, all right? So, in no particular order, I would like to ask to come on stage the following projects. Take me home. Uber Transport. Space Mining. Festiphone. Emergency Habitat. 3D Printing Drone. Bio Air. Brain Spool. And last but not least, Crop Spy. <laughs> so we should have nine. All right, we're good, we're good. So here's what's going to happen. First, congratulations for getting past this uh, first uh, hurdle of the weekend. And now I'm going to give you the microphone for about 20 seconds to quickly refresh the minds of everyone here about what the idea was, all right? So that afterwards, people can start choosing the idea that they like and you can start looking for team members. If remember to look for people with a diverse set of skills. You need to have in your team diverse point of views, people with different backgrounds and experiences, because that's how innovation is triggered. Also, we recommend you to have a team of six people, but no more than eight. There can be less, but just aim for six, no more than eight. Because if the team is too big, it's going to be hard to manage. Uh, mentors are going to have a hard time talking to you. Then, tomorrow morning, because I'm not going to have your attention afterwards, tomorrow morning, uh, you can start coming here at 8 o'clock. There will be breakfast for you. And just to optimize logistics, please raise your hands if you plan breakfast here. So we can, we can prepare the right amount and not waste food. Are we okay, guys? All right. So afterwards, at 9.45, we're going to start by announcing what will happen during uh, the day of Saturday, and we're going to let you know about the resources. You're going to have a lot of resources at your disposal, and as a first disclosure, you're going to have a web designer and a graphic designer here on site that will work with all the teams here. So just in case you don't have any graphic designer or web designer in your team, we have one of each for you to help you out during the weekend. I hope this will help to give a boost to your projects regardless of the skills that you get in your team. All right, tonight you can stay as long as you want. 
but when we are done with forming the teams, please go to the back and let the organizers know the name of the team and the people that are in your team. And then we're gonna give you a table on the upper floor and you can start working. You can stay here the whole night if you want, but you're not gonna be a company, there will be security downstairs, but we do recommend you that to spend like one hour to brainstorm and then get some rest because we do have a long weekend ahead. All right, so without anything else to add, I will give you a microphone about 20 seconds and you just pass it along so that you can refresh the, the minds of everyone here about your ideas. Let's hear it. So the Take Me Home uh, was a team effort idea and it's about a smart box which carries things, which knows the way home and also you can follow it or also with guidance for, for old people so they can also jump on it. Space mining is about uh, gathering, finding and gathering useful materials in outer space and uh, collecting data about uh, the exploration that we do alongside. Um, we will need robotics expert maybe, AI and machine learning expert and uh, maybe someone with uh, uh, yeah, knowledge in geology. Uber Transport, you want to revolutionize transport of goods, so please come to me. We need help with people knowing artificial intelligence, blockchain and everybody that is interested in revolutionizing transport. Thanks. So my idea is the uh, Festiphone uh, service that provides uh, cellular coverage for festivals. Actually, this could be modified into something just providing Wi-Fi because it seems to be more feasible. And so pe people I'm looking for would be uh, somebody who knows something about telecommunications or uh, yeah, network uh, administrative stuff. Um, yeah, <laughs> I have a space background. It doesn't really fit in there. <laughs> Um, so printing a drone or the idea is it, uh, 3D printing drone or um, insect, like a small robot for the uh, construct in the um, non area or emergency in situ, uh, uh, emergency site, uh, which use um, natural, natural resources. I think it's going to be a similar idea with, uh, with him, but we will see. Um, Later, if we can merge or not. So, uh, if, 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 if. Okay, so BioAir is all about cleaning the world's air. So, there's smoggy places, there's polluted places, and we want to use biotechnology and algae um, and innovation to try and solve those problems. So, we ideally, we need any chemists, any biologists, um, any engineers, um, and also, I'll be the first to admit, I'm no good at business. I, I like the ideas, I like innovating, but I'm no good at the business side. So, any business people, please come join. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, emergency habitat is about uh, habitats, small tent-like structures that can be deployed fast and easily first on the earth when there's an emergency and you need some safe space, but in the future for, um, yeah, maybe as a basis for something like the lunar la um, village or some, some other habitat on another planet. Uh, yeah, I'm a software developer and I need <laughs> everything. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Brimpo is, is the mess is the platform we would like to create to connect the expertise, the scientist, with the marketing needs in a more effective way. And then we'll make this world more innovative, and we will rock innovation today. This way, we came together. So I'm personally is educated, a PhD in physical chemistry, and I'm familiar with science, and I did MBA uh, freshly. So for this point, I'm 
team members who believe in innovation, who believe in its concepts, who has a background from co finance, marketing, and also from database part, we highly appreciate to, be to invite you to become our team members to rock science this weekend together. Thank you. <laughs>So uh, thanks for the votes, amazing results. <laughs> um, yeah, CropSpy uh, will empower small farmers in developing countries to boost their agricultural productivity. And my team uh, will develop an app to translate this geodata to um, develop like video tutorials or farming instructions for these farmers. Um, and the farmer will only pay if they really gain in yield. So there's this guarantee built in. And the team will need app developers, obviously. And um, we will need data scientists and people that are interested in uh, agriculture and crop science and so on. Thank you very much. All right, so these are the nine ideas with the biggest number of votes. But remember what I told you earlier. If your idea did not get enough votes, but you managed to convince at least two people to join you, you can form a hacker team. And you just need to let us organizers know that you have your own hacker team, and then you, have, you can like jump into the final competition and present on Sunday as well. Or you can join one of these teams here, and you guys should start recruiting. This is like an organic process, so you just talk to each other. There's nothing formal about it and it's gonna take somewhere between like 15 and 25 minutes. And when you're done, just let us know and you can go upstairs and start working. So let's start the team formation process now.